Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today for Not Alone, How to Help Transgender Survivors in Detention Part 2. My name is Camila Willingham. I'm a program associate at JDI and I'll be your moderator today. JDI is a health and human rights organization that works to end sexual violence in all forms of detention. JDI has three core goals to hold government officials and agencies accountable for sexual abuse in their facilities, to change public attitudes about sexual violence behind bars, and to ensure survivors of prisoner rape get the help that they need. We'd like to take a moment to thank the Office on Violence Against Women for its generous support of this webinar and our larger project called No Bad Victims, Support for Incarcerated Survivors. Just a few things before we get started. I want to remind you that some of what we're going to be discussing today may be upsetting or hard to hear. Please take care of yourselves. This webinar will be recorded, so you can come back to it later if you need to. You can submit questions and comments throughout the webinar using the questions box on the right side of your screen. And a closed captioned recording of this webinar will be posted on our website justdetention.org slash advocate dash resources. That'll be up in the next few days. We'll send you more information on that later today, including a link to an evaluation of this webinar. We have a wide range of other resources available on our, web, on our website, um, and we'll go over those in more detail at the end of today's webinar. This webinar is the second in our series on helping transgender survivors of sexual abuse in detention. The aim of the series is to help community-based rape crisis organizations and other service providers like yourselves understand the issues facing transgender survivors in adult facilities. Today's webinar will focus on how you as advocates can provide services to this extremely vulnerable population. We're going to cover the following. We'll begin with the testimony from a transgender woman who survived sexual abuse in detention. We'll review the PREA protections for transgender inmates. We'll talk about a few corrections agencies' policies for transgender inmates. We'll chat with Jen Orthwine from the Transgender Law Center about her experience as a clinician and as an attorney working with transgender survivors. We'll talk with Erlene Budd, an advocate from Washington, D.C., about her experience working with transgender survivors. And finally, we'll end with time to answer some of your questions. A quick note on some terms before moving on. While law enforcement prosecutors and victims' rights groups tend to use the term victim in recognition of the crime that was committed, JDI prefers to use the term survivor. We do this to honor the strength and resiliency it takes to live through a sexual assault and for that person to heal. The terms inmate and prisoner will be used interchangeably to refer to incarcerated people. If you have questions about a specific term, please use the questions box and a JDI staff member will assist you. We're going to start with the survivor story. This is Zahara. Zahara was sexually abused several times in the Georgia Department of Corrections system. I'm going to read you the testimony that she shared with JDI. My name is Zahara. I'm 24 years old and I'm a pre-op trans woman. I've been transitioning for four years now, but I've known I wanted to be a girl since I was five. I came to serve out my sentence for shoplifting, something I turned to in order to make money for myself, because it's hard to find a job as a trans woman in the South. I've been incarcerated for two years now, and over my incarceration stint, I've been sexually assaulted two times. When I first got to prison in Georgia, I was put in general population. A guy, Bronx, came up to me and told me that he was in prison for murder and that he would protect me and take care of me in exchange for being his friend. Being extremely naive at the time, I took his offer because I was scared. It was my first time in prison around dangerous men. After a week, he asked me for a sexual favor. You're not entitled to sex with me. We are only friends, I said. He then grabbed me by the throat and pushed me to the wall and told me, you're mine. You're indebted to me now. I quickly relented and performed oral sex. Over time, he got tired of that and asked me for anal sex. I knew I couldn't do that because of the high risk of catching HIV, so I wrote a letter to the deputy warden telling him about the situation. I never received a response. I requested protective custody, and Bronx requested it too. He was able to influence the staff to place
place us in the same cell, and that next night he raped me by razor blade point. I placed the letter through the door telling the officer I was raped. I was eventually seen by a sane nurse who was very nice. I was transferred to another facility where I live in a one man in a one man cell on a block with other transgender inmates. I believe that many transgender individuals are scared to report because of the risk of being placed in segregation. So a lot of assaults are not reported. That's what happened to me. I did not report some of the assaults until it got out of hand because I didn't want to be on lockdown. I hope I can help someone not go through what I went through. What happened to Zahara is awful. I wish that I could say that her story is unique, but unfortunately what happened to her is all too common. People who identify as transgender are often subjected to extreme violence behind bars. We hear from lots of survivors who, like Sahara, are afraid to report this violence for fear of being put in isolation. Even if they feel safe enough to reach out for help, they're often not taken seriously. Over the next hour, we'll talk about the PREA protections afforded to transgender inmates, and we'll talk to two advocates, Dr. Jen Orthwine from the Transgender Law Center and Erlene Budd, an advocate in the Washington, D.C. area, who will talk about her experiences advocating for the rights of incarcerated transgender survivors. I want to remind you that we've covered how to provide direct services to prisoners in general in great detail during previous webinars, which are all available on our advocate resources page. Before we get started, I'd like to get an idea of what you're hoping to learn from today's webinar. You can submit your answer by typing it into the questions box. I'll just give you a few minutes to, to submit some of those. Great, so we're seeing you'd like to hear about some of the PREA protections, how to help transgender survivors come overcome some common challenges. Um, to be more aware of what's happening in other parts of the country. These are great. So many of these will be answered throughout the webinar. And if we don't get to something, feel free to reach out to us afterwards by email at advocate at justdetention.org. And you can submit questions to us on the, oops, sorry, um, you can also submit questions to us on the webinar throughout and we'll try to answer them later on. I would now like to introduce Carolina Aparicio, who will go over some of the PREA protections for transgender inmates. Unmuted. Thanks so much, Camila. Um, so because of cases like Zahara's and the research we've reviewed during the first part of this webinar series about the high rates of sexual abuse, of transgender inmates, the PREA standards include several provisions specifically for transgender inmates. Um, improving your knowledge and comfort with the standards can be very helpful for your advocacy work with corrections agencies and the transgender clients you serve. In this section, we'll review the applicable standards. You'll see the citation for each standard at the bottom of each slide. It's important to note that corrections agencies are in different places in terms of their implementation of the PREA standards. So what that means is that some agencies may have already updated their policies, practices, trainings, and protocols. Some are currently enforcing those changes, and some are changing their institution's culture, while others have not. So remember that all of these things take time, and everyone is not yet on the same page. Your clients can often indicate where facilities are at in this process. As part of the community, your advocacy and collaboration with corrections agencies helps hold them accountable to proper implementation and ultimately works to keep people safe. In order to address the kind of disrespect and sexual harassment that transgender people encounter on a daily basis, um, in detention, which we discussed in the first webinar, it's important to note the two PREA provisions on effective communication. The first one states that a facility must, tr must train its staff to speak effectively and professionally with transgender inmates. The second standard says that a facility must also have a written zero tolerance policy on sexual harassment and sexual abuse. So this means that, that staff, the staff is prohibited from sexually harassing inmates including making demeaning references to gender, 
sexually suggestive or derogatory comments about someone's body or clothing, and obscene or obscene language or gestures. While these may seem like a given to you, um, this type of disrespectful behavior is all too common for most of the trans inmates we hear from. Searches are a regular part of an inmate's everyday routine, yet we hear from inmates all the time, especially transgender inmates, about being ab abusively searched by staff, sometimes to publicly humiliate them, to determine someone's genitalia, or for someone who is a perpetrator, it's an opportunity to inconspicuously sexually abuse someone under the pretext of, quote, doing their job, unquote. So in order to address these issues, there are two PREA provisions that specifically address searching transgender people. The first provision states that a facility must not search or physically examine a transgender inmate solely to determine their genital status. If someone's gender is unknown, it can be determined by talking with the inmate, reviewing the inmate's medical records, or from a broad medical exam examination conducted by a private doctor. The second provision states that a facility must train its staff to properly search a transgender inmate in a professional and respectful manner. That does not necessarily require that a trans woman be, be searched by a female officer or a trans man be searched by a male officer, although that may be the situation after a case-by-case -case determination that that's the most appropriate situation for that individual. Finally, the last set of protections we'll discuss are about housing and classification. The first standard on this says that a facility must conduct an intake screening to assess every inmate who enter, enters their facility for their risk of victimization. To help determine the best place to house an inmate and what kind of programming to assign them, the, the facility must take the following into consideration. If an inmate is transgender, if they have previously experienced sex sexual victimization, and the inmate's own perception of their vulnerability, so whether or not they feel safe in a particular housing or programming um, situation. So however, in most cases, according to the standards, a facility cannot segregate transgender inmates solely based on their gender identity. This protection extends to lesbian, gay, and bisexual people as well. That means they cannot have a transgender unit where they house all of the transgender, their transgender inmates or what's often called, referred to as a gay pod. The one exception to this rule would be under a court order. As talked about in our previous webinar, the majority of inmates are housed by their genitalia. So a trans woman who, ha who may have been living her life as a woman for years, using a women's bathroom and staying at women's shelters, more often than not would find herself in a men's facility. But the standards say that the facility must conduct individualized assessments as to where a transgender inmate should be housed and how they should be programmed, which would ensure their health and safety. The standards do not require that a transgender man be housed at a men's facility or a transgender woman in a women's facility. It means that correction staff must do a case-by-case -case analysis and that process must include the individual's perspective as to where they feel they would be safest. In talking about housing with your client, it's important to remember that a transgender woman may feel safer in a men's facility and a transgender man may feel safer in a women's facility. So, so let the survivor take the lead and be open-minded about where they want to be housed. Erlene, one of our guest speakers, will speak more about this later in the webinar. A facility cannot abuse solitary confinement, which is also known as the SHU, or Segregated Housing Unit, Administrative Segregation, or ADSEG, um, also called the jail, lockup, or the hole. And they cannot abuse that as a means of keeping a transgender person safe. So historically and currently, many facilities put transgender inmates in solitary confinement to keep them safe from other inmates. PREA holds that this should only ever be done as a last resort, and if it must be done, just for a limited amount of time. Solitary confinement often means being locked up for 23 hours a day in a room the size of a bathroom with dim lighting, with limited or no programming, meaning work, school, or other programs, limited contact with other people, including peer groups and friends, restricted access to reading materials and personal property, and limited access to rec time. 
Essentially, it means separating a person from other people, programming, and coping skills that are critical to healing from sexual abuse. Numerous studies have documented the negative effects of solitary confinement to a person's mental well-being. Many times, solitary leaves a person more vulnerable to abuse by their bunkmate or staff abusers. Given these conditions, you might have greater insight into understanding why Zahara, the trans woman who Camila talked about earlier, and others like her might decide to keep quiet instead of reporting abuse and facing time in solitary. There are moments where a survivor may request to be in segregation to get out of a dangerous situation, and Jen, our other guest, is going to talk more about that in a bit. Finally, the standards state that a reassessment of each transgender, in, trans, transgender inmate's housing and programming must be done at least twice a year. So if a trans inmate requests to be put in segregation, it's especially important to push for reassessment so they're not stuck in isolation. I want to share a quote with you from Jamie, a trans woman survivor who is in a Michigan state prison. In a letter to JDI, Jamie said, Imagine living in a cell or cube about the size of an average bathroom with another inmate. Picture the middle of the night when guards are pretty much sleeping and your cellmate or cellmates have pulled the covers off, are pulling down your pajamas and underwear, and then pretty much having their way with you because there's nothing you can do about it. Or there's something you do, which is to seek indefinite protective segregation while the perpetrators walk free as a bird. Picture enduring that for 166,440 hours. So I think that quote paints quite a vivid picture of what, what choices or lack thereof that many trans, trans survivors have. I'd now like to turn things over to my colleague Desiree Maximbol, who will talk to you about some of the transgender policies that various corrections agencies have in place already. Muted. Thanks, Carolina. So several facilities have created protocol and policies to comply with PREA standards addressing transgender inmates. The slide lists of just a few agencies, prisons, jails, juvenile facilities from across the country that have drafted and enacted such policies and protocol. While we still haven't seen a perfect model policy as of yet, these agencies are certainly on the forefront of creating good policy regarding transgender inmates. As best practice, some of these facilities, like Denver County in Colorado, um, have brought transgender advocates and experts to help with the process of creating their policies. And others, like Santa Clara County Juvenile Detention Facility, have rather comprehensive um, policies that include sections on respectful communication with transgender and gender nonconforming residents. And then other facilities, like Washington, Washington, D.C. Department of Corrections have created a multidisciplinary body, and in other places sometimes it's called um, the Gender Identity Committee, that determines that every, where every transgender and gender nonconforming inmate um, can be most hou safely housed and programmed. Erlene will talk about this in much more detail um, in regards to what her jurisdiction is doing using this model. Um, so now we'd like to hear from you. Uh, what kind of policies or guidelines do you think are most important for any agency that wants to demonstrate respect for transgender survivors? Um, feel free to submit your answers in the question box to your right. And I'll just give you a couple minutes to do that. Um, so what we've heard is ways staff can talk about trans inmates respectfully, like using preferred pronouns and names. Okay. And then here's another. Um, I think it's important that corrections and law enforcement treat trans survivors and all survivors with the same level of care and respect as those in the community. <laughs> Perfect. Great. Thank you for sharing. Okay. Um, so now in this section, we're going to talk with two advocates about their experience working with incarcerated transgender survivors. First, I'd like to introduce Dr. Jennifer Orthwine. Jen is a pro bono attorney with the Transgender Law Center, where her work focuses on institutionalized transgender, pe trans transgender people's rights. 
She is licensed to practice law and psychology in California. She, be she began her career as a psychologist in the California correctional and hospital systems, and her legal work with the Transgender Law Center is largely informed by those experiences. Thank you for joining us, Jen. Thank you, Desiree. I'm happy to be here. Awesome. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about your experience providing therapy to transgender survivors? Sure. I worked at the Department of Mental Health within the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. I was based in the California Medical Facility, um, which is a triage hospital for all of the Department of Corrections in California. Um, I was placed in the mental health ward for acute crisis and um, in the intermediate care program. My mentor, Dr. Carl VSD, um, whom I work closely with, is the transgender specialist at uh, the California Medical Facility and is the main clinician who has been doing assessments for uh, transgender inmates for all of CDCR for the past 15 years. I work primarily with transgender women as CMF is a men's facility. And as Carolina stated before, most transgender women are housed in men's facilities. Every person I worked with who was transgender indicated they had been physically or sexually assaulted at some point during their incarceration, but they wouldn't give more details for fear of retaliation and the dynamics of prison. Yeah, the, unfortunately that's something that we've heard from a lot of the transgender women who write JDI. Um, so from your experience as a clinician, what are some of the most common clinical issues that transgender um, survivors experience? Sure. Um, almost every person who I worked with met the criteria to be diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. I didn't often know what led to those symptoms or trauma. Um, sometimes it was many, many factors or many, many experiences. But many transgender and gender nonconforming survivors experience insidious trauma. This occurs in a situation where someone is constantly at risk or is vulnerable, for instance, where they feel threatened all the time. What also comes up a lot is fear and hypervigilance meaning feeling nervous and super alert. Survivors are constantly looking out for danger. Their minds are constantly in fight or flight mode. Um, that can cause a person to feel lethargic, emotionally and physically drained, and it can cause um, panic attacks. For a lot of inmates, there is no option for flight. So given that's the situation for a lot of survivors, do you have any suggestions for advocates who are listening as to how they can help their clients who are facing that, these issues? Sure. Um, finding safety in prison is difficult. It's important to understand that you likely will not be able to make someone feel safe um, and to realize, or not someone, excuse me, that you won't, that you will not be uh, able to make someone safe um, and to realize that you are not there to fix everything. The person may not feel safe in the prison environment, but they can feel safe talking to you. Foster a sense of trust in a place where someone can feel comfortable. Given the person, yeah, give the person the opportunity to talk about their experience without intervening. Listen with an empathetic ear and never question the person's experience or how they are handling it. Instead, be understanding and empathetic to their experience. Don't give false promises. Be clear about your limitations. Help them find the power to identify what they think they, will, they have immediate control over in order to feel safe. They try to ask open-ended questions like, what worked for you in the past? Did deep breathing or relaxation in the moment help you? These can disengage hypervigilance and panic. Understand that support systems are really important in detention. I ask, is there someone you, who you feel safe around? Are there any staff or inmates that you can trust? Great. Um, so thank you for sharing your experiences and insights as a psychologist working with the CDCR. I hope you don't mind if we change gears a little bit and talk about legal issues. Um, can you share with us the major legal issues facing transgender folks um, that advocates can help with? Sure. I can think of a few. Some inmates don't know about their rights to be free from sexual abuse under PREA. Um, so it's very important to, to educate them on what their rights are and how, how to access them. Um, in an attempt to secure their safety, many trans women find themselves in coercive relationships, as, as um, the example read earlier demonstrates. Often, transgender inmates' reports of sexual abuse are dismissed or ignored. Their assault is perceived by staff as a result of that person's gender expression. And, and having staff respond to these reports um, can be traumatizing in and of itself um, in such a manner. So many inmates may request um, 
make requests for help with housing and classification to get out of a dangerous situation. And some inmates take it upon themselves to, to try to be moved for other reasons to get out of a situation. And inmates also need assistance obtaining proper mental health treatment. They may be in crisis or need a mental health bed, assess for suicidal ideation and debilitating effects of anxiety and panic attacks. Great. So that's a pretty comprehensive list. Um, do you have any suggestions as to how an advocate how an advocate can help other clients with these legal issues? Maybe let's just start with the first two, uh, PREA and uh, sexual dynamics in prison. Sure. Um, it is important to learn more about the PREA standards and how they are implemented at the facilities in your area and inform your clients about these protections. They should also have a PREA coordinator at the facility that they can talk to and that can work with them. Um, create space to talk of, about coercive relationships. Um, help them understand that when sex is coercive, those relationships can cause serious damage over time. Talk to them about how coercive sex is a form of sexual assault and it is illegal. But overall, be empathetic to your client's needs for safety in a prison context. Regardless of whether they decide to engage in coercive sex or decide to pursue other methods to obtain safety, with that knowledge, it helps to foster a sense of empowerment in that context. Um, can you tell us more about how advocates can support survivors around legal issues like ignored grievances and housing requests and even mental health um, issues? Yeah, first, when it comes to legal advocacy in general, really assess, discuss, and make sure that legal advocacy is something that the survivor really wants. Sometimes retaliation and concerns for their safety will inform their decision to report. It's important to respect that person's decision and not lead them down a path that might cause them more anxiety. It's fine to explore the options with them, though. Um, always listen to what the client wants. If they don't feel safe, don't push it. Understand that in many places, it is common for staff to ignore reports of sexual abuse or not take them seriously, especially reports made by trans inmates, and that one of the main underlying and and that is one of the main underlying causes of transphobia. Oh, excuse me, one of the main underlying causes of that is transphobia. You can help to get the reports acknowledged. You can write letters or make follow-up call, phone calls or speak with the PREA coordinator in person. Prisons tend to be more willing to pay attention and respond when they have outsiders looking in. They don't want to appear to the outsider to not be doing their job. Similarly, you can also help with housing and classification requests related to sexual abuse in many of the same ways. It is important to know the specifics and become familiar with the PREA regarding housing and classification, which Carolina went over earlier, and their Eighth Amendment rights so that you can draft advocacy letters on the survivor's behalf. When a transgender inmate requests to be put in solitary confinement because they feel it is the safest thing to do if they are in danger, it is especially important to advocate for them to be reassessed because their current situation may no longer meet their needs. So for the advocates that are um, interested in drafting these kinds of letters, what should they be including? I'd say when writing a letter, it would be important to include why the move you are suggesting is important for their safety, um, why, it why it is important for their mental health, and that the move will be in line with federal regulations and the inmate's Eighth Amendment rights, which prohibits cruel and, cruel and unusual punishment. Oh, and then earlier, uh, sorry, I had asked if you could talk a little bit about mental health advocacy. Could you tell us a little bit more about that, please? Sure. Um, you know, mental health staff can be strong allies. They are allowed to advocate for new housing assignments, although sometimes their, advocate, um, their requests go unheard by corrections. Um, they do have the ability to advocate. Um, a lot of mental health staff still need a lot of training with this, though, and may not know that they have the ability to advocate on the inmate's behalf. In some jurisdictions, you can contact mental health staff or the inmate can have the staff contact you. Survivors can request to speak to outside counselors through mental health staff and talk about what a client needs together. A lot of mental health staff realize that they have more power than people on the outside. It may be helpful to point out that the primary goal of providing care is to advocate for our clients and to provide safety. So collaboration with mental health staff is key. Remember, according to the standards, an inmate does not have to name the perpetrator. They only need to reveal that they have been abused in order to receive medical and mental health care. 
Thank you. Thank you for covering all of that. Um, so to summarize, what key points would you highlight for our advocates that would be helpful with both clinical and legal issues? Sure. Um, it's always important to take your time and make sure to build rapport with the client. I think this, this is the most important part of the work that we do. Affirm and respect their gender identity. Ask how they would like to be addressed. Never question your client's feelings or what happened to them. Try to address their sense of safety. Empathize with them. State your role and limitations. Focus on asking open-ended questions. These should help them explore their options and give them a sense of agency. And educate yourself about prison culture and transgender people's experiences. Great. And finally, do you have any resources that you would like to share with our advocates? Sure. Um, in my work, I, I often send um, pamphlets and things to uh, inmates. Um, so I would, and one of the ones I use the most um, is JDI's Hope for Healing booklet. Um, it's a great resource for me and my clients. Um, JDI has many other great resources as well. Also, the Transgender Intersex Justice Project has a publication called Stiletto, which you may might find helpful and useful. And I, I believe that the transgender inmates that you may be working with um, and survivors would also find this useful. Um, TGIJP also provides a letter writing um, and support for um, from people who have formerly been incarcerated or had similar experiences to those who are currently incarcerated. And then Black and Pink is a great resource uh, for pen pals and, and people to be able to share their experiences and and um, and get feedback from other other people as well. Great. Thank you, Jen, for all your advice and insight. Um, so before I introduce our next guest, I just want to remind everybody in the audience to submit any questions you have using the question box. Uh, Jen will be here for our question and answer section. So I, I'm sure you'll have lots of questions for her. OK. So now we're going to hear from our advocate from our nation's capital, Ms. Erlene Budd. Erlene is a 56-year-old transgender woman and former executive director of the Transgender Health Empowerment Incorporated. Erlene is currently a treatment adherence specialist at Helping Individual People Survive Incorporated, a discharge planner and liaison for, for transgender issues for the Washington, D.C. Department of Corrections and sits on the Transgender Advisory Committee uh, for the Washington, D.C. DOC. Thank you for joining us, Erlene. Thank you. Great. Um, so can you please tell us a little bit about your experience providing ser um, services to transgender survivors? Well, um, and, and thank you so much for having me on this most important webinar. And um, my experience actually uh, extends over 10 years in terms of my work as a volunteer with the D.C. Department of Corrections as a discharge planner. Um, I've kind of been um, designated as the liaison for transgender issues for the D.C. Department of Corrections facilities which includes the community correctional centers, which we call halfway houses. Mm -hmm. Now, that in part is because of my experience of being previously incarcerated with the Department of Corrections, which I've never made it a secret that I am a returning citizen. I also sit uh, currently on the D.C. Department of Corrections Director's Transgender Advisory Committee, which we just recently met last week. And we actually hear new uh, transgender inmate cases weekly who come into the jail normally every Wednesday, and that okay. sometimes can change. Okay. And so can you please tell us uh, a little bit more about the role of the Transgender Advisory Committee? Well, um, every, um, uh, tr what happens is every transgender inmate incarcerated at the D.C. Department of Corrections is seen by the D.C. Um, Department of Corrections Transgender Committee. That committee is comprised of a medical um, practitioner. We have a mental health clinician that sits on, a correctional supervisor, and a chief case manager, and a DOC approved volunteer, who is currently myself, who is a member of the transgender community, or what they consider an acknowledged expert in transgender affairs. Now, what happens is that committee actually determines the transgender inmate's housing assignment only after we actually review all the inmates' records, the assessments, and an interview with the inmate. During that time, which that inmate provides his or her own opinion of, of their vulnerability in the jail population, which we take uh, and consider very seriously. Actually, we make so that it's clear specifically to when we're talking about uh, based on someone's housing, based on their actual uh, uh, personal appearance, then we actually make a recommendation. The ultimate decision uh, has to go through some channels and to the warden. 
Okay, so that's great to hear that that's like uh, many people involved in that process. So can you break that down a little bit, and go into a little bit more detail for our advocates? Yeah, so what has happened is, based on the policy that the Department of Correction has and the D.C. Human Rights Act, every transgender inmate, be they male to female or female to male, they must be, I must emphasize again, must be offered the opportunity to be housed either by their sex at birth or their gender identity. Now, for instance, um, if you have a male to female transgender woman, like myself, meaning um, my assigned sex at birth was male and my gender identity is female, who is incarcerated and comes before this committee, the question that they're asking, asking me would be, would I prefer to be housed with females based on my gender identity or with males based on my assigned sex at birth? Now, most of the trans and inmates that come before us at the D.C. Department of Corrections uh, System are transgender women of color. Uh, we've had 98% uh, of color, 1% uh, 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 Caucasian, and 1% uh, uh, Latino, Hispanic. The majority of the transgender women, and there have been hundreds, which uh, they've gone through this committee process, they have, been elect they have elected to be housed by their sex at birth. I reiterate by their sex at birth. While a minority choose to be housed by their gender identity. Okay. And so can you give us an example of an inmate who has gone through this process? Well, I actually chose to highlight uh, that we had one female to male, um, specifically one female to male transgender person who was in the process of reassignment surgery um, and um, who was placed in the men's facility at the meeting with the committee and the vote was a recommendation was to allow it. But um, this was also at the request of that inmate. Okay. And what we were told is that it uh, kind of got out to the officers and maybe some of the other inmates that this uh, inmate possibly was female to male. And after that, the inmate felt very unsafe, so he had requested to be reclassified and to be housed in the women's uh, housing unit. After he was moved into the uh, female housing unit, um, but was given what he was, but given that he was in transition, and after some um, interactions he had with some of the female inmates, he felt himself, he said, unsafe there as well. Okay. So we're, we're we're dealing with you know someone with clearly they had a full beard, he, uh, you know he was waiting on top surgery, but you know he uh, he was strapped, uh, what we call strapped in at that time. And in the female housing unit, he faced as much of a threat because of his appearance as male. There was um, a lot of sexual harassment and notes like, if you, if you mess with, you know, so-and-so, I'll do this to you and that to you. And they were talking about, you know, being my baby's daddy, those kind of things. So we were able to actually reclassify him and move him, move him to the female um, community corrections halfway house where he successfully completed that program and was discharged. Now, he said after that process, he said that after that, that process was really okay, but there were some bumps along the way there as well. Okay. Wow. That sounds like a, quite a process. Um, so just to kind of change uh, gears a little bit, um, can you tell us about a time that you successfully advocated for a trans inmate who was sexually abused? Well, yes. Um, during uh, some of the sessions that we have at the jail, and we do individual counseling sessions, um, we, we found out that a transgender woman um, found her cellmate um, was forcing himself on top of her in the course of uh, the night as she explained it. And then she had, uh, told me about it during a counseling session that we were having. But at that point, um, she really didn't feel comfortable bringing charges against him but because of the agreement that we have, meaning as an employee, uh, a volunteer for the D.C. Department of Correction, I had to bring this to my supervisor's attention, which was Chaplain Betty Green. And this is because of, in January of 2012, Director Thomas Faust of D.C. Department of Correction um, entered a, a policy, which is uh, around the elimination of sexual abuse, assault, and misconduct under um, the uh, program statement 3350. So um, we talked about the, the protections that FREA provides, but she still didn't feel comfortable pressing charges. Now in terms of safety, we talk mostly about housing and classification. Now she did not want to be put in protective custody 
and she did not want the other person moved because she she did not want to be seen so much as a snitch. She she actually said to me, if they lock me down, I'll be seen as a snitcher. So um, you know, we actually brought her back before the committee, reclassified her. Uh, the supervisor and they moved it to another housing unit and that's what the survivor actually wanted was to be moved away from her abuser and she did not want to file charges and there are a lot of those kind of situations by the way. Okay well I'm glad to hear that she was able to secure something that was safest for her. Yeah. Um, so uh, just to again uh, talk about an issue that a lot of, um, I would say, a lot of advocates probably experience and certainly a lot of survivors experience. Can you talk about an example of how to, uh, how to relate to staff or talk to staff about respectfully communicating with a transgender inmate? Yeah, well, so in uh, what I've seen in a lot of places, people are going to say that we, you know, we don't, you know, follow this policy, you know. And I don't make it all about the policy. You know, I can often say that in my training that I conduct, just imagine that you're working with, you know, a transient survivor. At the end of the day, now wouldn't it be easier if you met that person halfway and follow the procedures, be respectful, and not use the wrong pronouns or use, you know, uh, inappropriate pronouns or whatever the case may be so you can just kind of get through it and maintain. I just had a case with um, the, uh, the federal, what we call the federal, the half, I guess, halfway houses, Department of Corrections, and um, they have to do what they call, you know, the job verification, and it's been calling and asking for a trans woman who's using male, by using male pronouns, which is a big problem. Now, in most cases, you're going, you know, going to work with that person for a short time. You want to make it as easy as possible for both of you. Now, sometimes that's not all it takes. It's about being respectful. Otherwise, you're going to have to um, have a disgruntled transgender survivor sitting before you who's not going to want to work with you and who's not going to cooperate. And that's not going to make a um, um, difficult, that's going to make a difficult program. I also work with parole officers and supervise transgender survivors when they get out of jail. I've had some of them who say some uh, um, very harsh things about um, this likeness. Um, and they say, Ms. Bud, you're talking about this gentleman as if he's female. And he's on my caseload and his X and Y on the legal documents. So, you know, I have to really break it down. I say to them that, you know, and we're talking about what we call CISOSA here in the district. I say to them at the end of the day, we spend an hour talking about how the transgender person is not cooperating with you, but can I ask, I usually say to them, can I ask you something? Do you think that if you use a little bit, just a little bit of, of common sense, in an office just between you and that person, if I just call that person she, is it really going to hurt? All right, yes. You got a legal document that says he is on the, he on the paper, but you're respecting their gender identity, don't you think that it would make it better? And I guess what uh, I've been doing and at some of these trainings, if I've had officers come up to me and say, Ms. Bud, it is really, it is really working well. Now, unfortunately, um, you know, there will always be people who are going to continue having their own homophobic ideas, and that's, you know, when the policy can be especially helpful. Now, as an advocate, um, if, if you say to a staff person you should be respectful of this transgender person, it can be helpful. But when there's a policy, both the facility and the staff take it more seriously. I think most places should have developed and should develop their own policies. Now, I would recommend that advocates support facilities to consider looking at the DOC, D.C. Department of Corrections, or other policies from around the country to help develop their own policies and their procedures around respectfully working with transgender inmates. Thank you, Ms. Bud. That's I mean, the way that you frame that. I think can be really helpful for a lot of us advocates. Um, so, just to kind of conclude, uh, what concrete tips or advice would you give an outside counselor who's working with transgender inmates who've been sexually abused? What do you think that they can do best to help their clients um, while they're behind bars? Well, one would be, first of all, making sure that that person 
as understanding what it means to be transgender, and then how to work with the male to female or the female to male. You know, know your resources. You know, that's really been helpful for me, collaborating, identifying other agencies and trans advocates who can help you. And especially when you have um, a case that you feel you can deal with on your own. Some folks are just doing this because it's a job, but at mm -hmm. the end of the day, you have to have a compassion for this work that we do. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Budd. Um, so I have some uh, advocacy resources listed. These are the ones that we had mentioned earlier today, and uh, hopefully they can be very helpful for, t for you as they've been for other folks. Thank you. Thanks, Desiree, and thanks again to Erlene and Jen for sharing your expertise. Um, I want to encourage you all again to submit any questions you might have about what Desiree and our guests went over um, or anything else from the webinar using the question box on the right. Now I'd like to share a quote from a survivor named Ophelia. Ophelia is a transgender woman who was an inmate in the Virginia prison system um, who we were in touch with for several years. She was released a few years ago and wrote, I want you to know your thoughts are what helped me and continue to help me through this difficult time. This is the effect that you already have and can continue to have in transgender people's lives. I know, or I hope that you feel empowered and motivated to support the Zaharas, the Esmeraldas, and the Ophelias in your own communities. And remember that you're not alone in doing this work. There is a community of support out there for you as advocates as well. Um, I hope you take advantage of the advocacy resources that we just went over. We'll be sending out a list of those in the follow-up email um, after the webinar today as well. And remember that you can always contact JDI for questions or technical assistance. Unmuted. Um, now my colleague, Carolina Aparicio, is going to go over some of your questions. Thanks so much, Camila. So we're getting um, a few questions. Please submit more. We have um, quite a bit of time for questions. Um, if if you want. So our first question, um, and, oh, I, I'd also like to invite Linda McFarlane, one of our deputy executive directors, to join us for the Q&A. Um, and so actually the first question is for you, Linda. Um, okay. Hi, we everyone. A, <laughs> we have a question. Um, it says, I'm a PREA coordinator in Florida. Our state standards require that we cannot house males and females together. I like the concept of allowing transgender people to be housed by their gender identity, but we can't do that due to the standard. How are, ag how are agencies dealing with this problem? What a great question, and thank you for struggling, wrestling with that. I um, appreciate the sentiment behind this. So I think one of the ways that places are addressing that is if the facility goes through a thoughtful process to determine um, that, let's say, the women's housing unit is the safest and best place for a particular um, transgender woman, that, that that facility has decided that that person's gender identity is primary, right? And so that that person is a woman and is being housed with other women. And I think this is where many of the things in the Prius standards call for uh, all of us, and, and in this case corrections, to really kind of rethink the way something is looked at. So that I think, you know, as, as folks probably know, previously it was always looked at, okay, you know, genitalia determines what a person is, and what we're looking at more now is that, that actually gender identity, how the person lives, how they identify, where they would socially, emotionally, psychologically fit best is actually primary. So that's why the standards say that in deciding whether to assign a transgender or intersex inmate to a facility for male or female inmates, the agency shall consider on a case-by-case -case basis. So the federal standards clearly give someone who's thinking as you are at your Florida facility um, some backup to, to say that there, there is actually a different way to think about who is male and who is female than perhaps the way you've done it before. And I, and I hope that makes sense. And, and, and it may require, um, in order to really meet this Prius standard, 
It may require a relooking at those state standards. It may require a redrafting of that piece of it, or it may simply require that sort of you go back and in a thoughtful way, perhaps but probably with your attorneys, um, have a new um, sort of decision about what that actually means to house males with males and females with females, because we're looking at we're looking at thinking very carefully and thoughtfully about who is male and who is female, and I hope I hope that makes sense. Um, if Jen or Erlene have a different thought about what about that question, I'd love to hear it too. No, I think you've tackled it pretty well. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Okay. So our next question. Um, I think, Jen, you might be the best person to answer this. Um, you said rapport is important. How do I develop rapport if I only have 15 minutes of time at a time with someone on the phone? Well, I, I honestly think that that's a really great question. Um, and sometimes rapport does take some time to develop, especially when a person um, has difficulty trusting people, which oftentimes um, for transgender individuals, it, it can take some time um, because of the experience that they've had. So there may be some testing that goes on. And I think in, in this context, um, the most important thing is to make sure that if report if you're having if someone is testing you or they seem distrustful of um, of you that you make clear that you acknowledge and respect their gender identity, that you acknowledge and um, and and they and understand that they have experienced what they have experienced. Um, oftentimes, um, things that that kind of destroy this rapport building are you know mispronouning or or um, misidentifying the individual, um, and that can shut someone down really really quickly. So um, in that 15 minutes, it's really important to think of number one, listening, being empathetic. Um, never questioning their experience. And, and those things should help build rapport much quicker. Um, when a person realizes that you are um, respecting them and, and giving them the d dignity that they deserve, it's a lot easier to build rapport and it happens much quicker. Great. I think that's really helpful for myself as an advocate. <laughs> and I hope other people mm -hmm. do too. Um, so our next question, um, Linda, I think if you want to take it first, and then maybe Erlene. Um, I've been working with a transgender woman in my local prison. She's talked to me about being called a he all the time by the staff there, and it really mm -hmm. upsets her. Would, would that be considered sexual harassment under PREA, and what would you recommend that I do about it? Um, I guess, I mean, the first thing I might, I'll, I'll talk about is if that's considered sexual harassment under PREA, and I'll go back to the definitions of sexual harassment under PREA, which is that, that when, if it's coming from a staff member, it's, it's repeated, one of the definitions is repeated verbal comments or gestures of a sexual nature to an inmate, detainee, or resident by a staff member, including demeaning references to gender sexually suggestive or derogatory comments about body or clothing or obscene language. So, I mean, certainly this sounds like it is, it's both repeated and unwelcome. It is um, interpreted by this person as derogatory regarding her gender. So there, there's certainly an argument made that it could be, um, but I also think that, um, that it sounds like it's clearly a training issue. And, um, and I think sort of as advocates, we have to decide what's the best way to approach something. And um, I would think that this could be certainly something that she could make a complaint about or that um, the advocate, the advocate has um, contacts within the facility. And, and I think you've heard this from both Erlene and from, from Jen and from us on previous webinars that building those good relationships with with facility staff, with security staff, with mental health staff, um, really helps to have somebody to go to and say, hey, look, this is happening. This is really being interpreted. This is really feeling disrespectful, excuse me, disrespectful and distressing to this person and creating a hostile environment for her. What can we do about it? And, um, and if you don't have that kind of relationship, this can be a way to reach out to try to build it, um, but certainly also try to talk to your client about what can you do for it to advocate for yourself in this way? Is there somebody in the facility you can talk to? Um, is there 
you know, what, what have you heard? What are the policies? How are staff being trained? Can we find out if they're being trained to use respectful language um, and, and what that looks like? So again, I think that if it's, if it's, a, it's a pronoun issue, as, as Ms. Budd said earlier, um, there's, there's really, there's training, there's helping staff understand both why it's important and, and really is it so important to, as I think she brilliantly said, to not do that? What are you gaining by not doing that? Um, and so I think here, you know, again, deciding what's the best approach, sort of a joining with to help educate them approach um, or, or really hearing what your client is saying, that this is, that this, this is being interpreted as harassment by her and, um, and there, then there might be a different way to address that. Arlene, did, thank you. Linda, did you want to sure. add anything maybe about your own experience with that? And, and, and thank you, I did. Um, and absolutely, I'm, I'm actually was looking at the uh, documents, our documents around the PREA, and, that, and I think that it, it would actually meet the, um, the standards of harassment. But um, I, w I will say that, um, again, you know, I guess giving a lot of kudos to the D.C. Department of Corrections, um, you know, there's a zero tolerance. And I think it, it, what happens is if it's coming from the head up, meaning Director Thomas Faust is our director, and I can tell you, you know, he, he was a sheriff before, before he came to DOC, and he is just, uh, just, you know, I can't say enough about phenomenal because he's zero tolerance. Uh, himself and actually the late um, Deputy Director uh, Carolyn Cross, who was murdered on September the 7th, they were just trans allies. But the fact is there's zero tolerance to any misconduct based on the policies and what's been put in place. And I mean, some, you know, some officers have been reprimanded, and actually I understand that there may have been even uh, termination. But we don't have a lot of uh, this going on. We do have complaints. But when the transgender uh, residents uh, or inmates come before the committee, they usually will bring that up. And Mr. Uh, James Riddick, who's the administrator to the director uh, and was a former warden uh, to DLC, he takes it very serious. And I can tell you that they act on it promptly. And they also help and make that transgender uh, inmate that's come before the committee feel really, really comfortable. And so, you know, as someone that has been previously incarcerated before over 20 years or more ago, I can tell you that those, these things were not in place when I came through the system. And I really encourage anyone uh, that's working in a correctional facility to try to advocate, you know, to have, you know, a transgender committee or, you know, just, you know, a group that really meets with transgenders and make them feel comfortable and making sure that they adopt some of the policies as the DOC and DC and around the country has done in some of those places. Thank you so much, Arlene. I, I really... Um I want to echo that. <laughs> I think that's great advice, and I think um, I think our next question is is might be interesting for those who because um, you talk about having a great policy at the uh, D.C. Department of Corrections, which I think is fantastic. But um, this person says the client I work with is sexually harassed all the time, called names, and grabbed at. They have a policy, but it doesn't seem like they're enforcing it. How can I help in this situation? So either. Erlene, if you want to talk about that. Did I'm you sorry? say that was coming from the client? Yeah, the client I work with is sexually harassed all the time. Oh, oh, someone is saying there's a client that they work with. Yeah. So I would say that who, the person is advocating for that, that client, and if this we're talking about someone that's incarcerated, mm -hmm. and they're going through that, the need is to find out what the chain of command is and what you need to do. First of all, I always advise, advise any transgender inmates and other inmates that I work with to file what is called the um, the MA grievance form. And I know a lot of times those forms get discarded and all that, but that's the beginning point and then also keeping a copy of it. And then outside of that, if nothing happens in the, uh, the jail, the prison itself, when you're trying to get a redress, then there's always the outside. I'm sure most places have, like we have the D.C. Office of Human Rights, and we have, you know, you have the judicial system, the court. Sometimes it, can be, it has to be taken that far because I used to say uh, when I was filing cases that the only way to, to, to really see, uh, a to, to see some, some resolve is to hit people by their pockets. For some reason, money means a lot to different organizations. So when you sue them, you hurt them, and they take it very serious. Yep, right on. <laughs> uh, Linda, did you want to add anything? 
Yeah, I mean, just I certainly echo and agree with everything that Erlene said, but then, but also too, you know, if you are particularly if you're a rape crisis counselor, any that um, that of course to to pay attention to what that that client's really needing right now. So both. Um, to advocate, what is the best way to advocate? You know, is the grievance process a possibility, or does it is it just make sense to to file a grievance if they haven't already? Um, and then, as an advocate, to try to follow up to find out what's happened with that grievance and to find out um, again if this person is they have a policy. Why isn't being followed? Right. Whenever a place has a policy, you can fall back on that. But then, too, on the flip side, to find out, you know, what does the survivor really need from you right now? Um, is it is it more that you know they've done what they can to struggle and what they need from you is support and to hear and to believe and to listen that this this harassment is is traumatizing um, is creating an unsafe environment for them and that they'll have feelings and thoughts and fears about that that they'll want to express and to help them to to build coping skills to deal with that to protect themselves sort of their core emotionally while they're going through this because if it's a problem that sounds like it's that entrenched it's not going to get solved overnight no matter how incredible your advocacy is and so providing that support to that survivor to kind of make it another day in that hostile of an environment. Thank, thanks Linda and Erlene. Um, so our next question, um, Linda or um, or Erlene or Jen, um, how can I encourage the facility I work with to adopt a trans-friendly protocol or policy? So we've talked about um, poli good policies that are already in place. We talked about helping the individual client and what they want. But how do you actually adopt a, or push for adopting a trans-friendly protocol? Linda, if you want to start us off. Sure. I, I think that... Um that there are lots of examples out there right now. Um, certainly DC jail and Ms. Bud's work is, is a shining example of that. There's also um, several other places that have I, begun something like a gender identity committee or a transgender um, friendly policy or to and I think that what they have found, what the facilities are finding again and again is that these policies, this sort of move to create to treat transgender prisoners with with respect and dignity and ensure their safety makes the facility more dignified, safe, and respectful for everybody. Um, and I mean I think we know that as advocates, right? Whenever we protect one group of people's rights, we're all elevated. And I think that corrections are finding that again and again. So I'd say pulling out those examples and talking about what the what the big benefits are gonna be. Um, you know, safety money is one of the things. And and safety and the professional sort of status of the profession are other things that, that we can pull on. And then um, again, we would love for people always to do things for the right reason, but if they're not willing to do it for the right reason, I mean, again, there are protections, as you mentioned, Carolina, earlier, and, and, and both of our guest speakers did as well, in the Prius standards. It's a federal law. They're required to do some of these things. And so the best way to do that is to have a comprehensive policy that addresses everything that's in the standards. So, again, Go for the right reason, but if they won't do it for the right reason, go for the you know liability potential lawsuits and the requirements of the Prius standards. And I'd love to hear both what um, Jen and or Erlene. Well, uh, and this is Erlene. Um, I, I also I totally agree with what you just said, and I will only speak for what how DC actually came about doing what it has done. Yes, uh, the Office of Human Rights amend, amended its uh, Human Rights Act to include gender identity, sexual, and all that. So that was one of the provisions, then PREA came along. But the, I think the reality was we had a lot of advocates because in 2009, 2008, 2009, we actually had a director at the D.C. Department of Corrections who was really resistant to uh, any type of changes or special provisions around working with transgenders, and it took the community to get outraged. Uh, uh, Ms. Jerry Hughes and and a lot of others met the mayor's office of LBGT affairs, uh, uh, which was Jeffrey Richardson and them back in those days. And they actually advocated, the group came together, they got judges, lawyers, and all of them signed on. 
and it became a situation where the community was outraged and decided, you know, that we're going to make them. They must comply with what we call the Office of Human Rights uh, policies that have been set in place. And that's what happened. It, was, it, it happened, and then, you know, as, as I said, having a change in director and the leadership, now, even though the policy was put in place, the new director is just so zero tolerance to any, uh, you know, thing happening to transgender inmates while they're incarcerated that we don't have those problems. So sometimes it takes the community involvement to get involved if the, the prison or jail will not adopt at that time because there are a lot of places that really will tell you, you know, quickly that, no, we're not going to adopt any policies. We're not giving, and they feel like they're giving special provisions or, you know, we're doing something special for transgenders, and that's not really the case. I think that's a really good point. That it's it's not special. It's it's appropriate, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And can I just add? Um, yeah. To Jennifer, um, I just wanted to add both Linda and Arlene's comments are incredibly helpful and I think great avenues. Um, just one other option I think that might be considered is working with the mental health staff if you have a connection mm -hmm. with them um, and helping them to advocate. Um, around the mental health consequences of this behavior by the staff. And the, um, I know that when I was working in California, I drafted, um, using Chris Daly, um, Daly's uh, memo on you know, uh, um, model protocols for transgender inmates, um, I used that to help to, to create an administrative directive. And I passed it up to my clinical supervisor, um, who then presented it to the entire um, correctional and mental health staff in our facility. Um, unfortunately, the policy didn't pass, but now there's, there's a PREA guidelines to back it up. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that if you can get a mental health staff from the in, on the inside, or correctional staff for that matter, um, to be willing to, to do this advocacy um, internally, at least for that particular facility, um, that can be incredibly helpful. And you can help them you know, draft this in, in, in conjunction with the PREA standards. That's fantastic. Thanks for the reminder, Jen. Um, mm -hmm. So there, we have another question, um, a few more actually. Um, I heard there's some kind of protection for transgender pe inmates around showers. Um, can you talk about that? And Jen, I don't know if you know which which uh, Priya standard that is, or Linda, if you want to take that too. I can't give you the number specifically. Um, or just talk about it in general. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there there is a standard um, to prevent um, other inmates and uh, staff um, from um, the staff that are uh, of a different gender. Um, from viewing an individual in the showers. Um, so um, currently under mm -hmm. PREA, as I understand it, is that um, that they're supposed to provide some sort of privacy for transgender um, inmates um, when they shower. Um, I don't think a whole lot of facilities are doing this right now, um, but it's definitely in the standards as, as a means to prevent uh, sexual assault or gawking or catcalling, which often occurs when, when other inmates can see uh, trans people in the showers. Mm -hmm. Great. Right. It's a good reminder. Um, Jen, you talked about some coping skills. We have a question around um, what are helpful coping skills. I know that we went over this um, in, some, in quite some detail in an earlier webinar, but I think specifically when talking about trans survivors or just in general, what are some coping skills that you would give um, to some of your clients? Right. Um, well, I think, you know, like I said um, previously, I think identifying people that they can trust and um, and letting them know and speaking with them about their experiences um, is incredibly important. Obviously, your role um, as uh, crisis counselors is incredibly important. Um, so uh, helping them identify those people um, is, is a great coping skill, um, and then a, a identify you know how what support that they can give them. Um, I think. Also, what I see a lot of is, um, and, and this isn't always necessarily the best way, but in prison there's not a whole lot of options for um, transgender people to, to flee a situation. Um, so they'll try and take the um, housing into their own, in, into their own hands um, by you know, either behaving in a way that will get them transferred um, to a solitary facility. I don't recommend that, but any way that a person can identify things that they can do within their own agency to get um, to get transferred 
you know, if their if their if their concerns and um, their needs aren't being addressed by by the prison. So a lot of times um, I'll see uh, people come in who, you know, who are you know ide uh, having suicidal ideation, um, and and th that's a very real experience for them. But also they they are willing to report this to um, their medical provider or their mental health provider. Um, as a means to get out of the situation that they're in and get into a crisis bed or some sort of mental health bed um, to temporarily protect themselves. Um, you know, anxiety and relaxation techniques are incredibly helpful with people that are experiencing panic and anxiety in that environment. Um, you know, um, so those are just some of the things I can think of off the top of my head that I would recommend in terms of coping skills. Uh, like, um, also writing to people on the outside and and and. You know, I see a lot of trans, uh, transgender people who will write books and send them out to advocacy organizations or long letters um, explaining their experiences and 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 having that outlet to to to, to be able to process and and um, express what's going on to an outsider, whether that outsider can help or not, um, can be incredibly therapeutic and it's a great coping skill. Fantastic, thank you. Um, I think we have one more question, unless anyone else wanted to add to that. Um, I, I wanted to jump in for a second back sure. to the shower just for a second. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. I would say that um, um, just as in, in, uh, with us at the D.C. Department of Correction and our community shelters in the community, um, the same policies that we have in terms of when transgender inmates come into the jail, they have to be um, taken into a private area, shook down with less meaning uh, the only officers that are actually get to see that person is those that are, in most cases, usually one or two, because there's always having to be a backup. So uh, they don't even really, I don't think they even have the cameras anymore where they, you know, photograph, because there used to be a camera in the uh, R&D processing. So all that has pretty much changed. But that, that also um, goes to the showering in the units. Even though in the units they have the individual showers with the curtains, but the transient inmates are allowed to shower at a certain period in time. And in the, ha in the um, shelters, we have uh, moved policies, and most of the shelters have adopted that there are certain hours that, a transient, that the transient residents um, are given to shower, sometimes late at night after all the other residents have gone to bed, depending on what that transient person wants, especially those that have been victims that you know, are going through some stuff. So, we take that very serious with the showers, and uh, you know, DC again is very progressive across not just DOC but the government agencies. Most of them have policies and uh, procedures on how to deal with transgender folks when they come into their office spaces and all of that. So, thank you for that. That was really something I really need to chime in on. Thank you for adding that, Arlene. I think that's really helpful. Um, always good stuff from you. <laughs> um, so, our last question I wanted to. Oh, I'm just. The shower policy um, under the standards is number 115.42 um, standard F, and uh, in case any of you needed that. So the last question, um, which I think Jen might be, uh, might, this one might be good for you to answer. Um, can I do legal advocacy as a rape crisis counselor? I'm not a lawyer. Uh, I, I definitely think that... Um Anyone can do legal ad advocacy as long as they educate themselves on on the legal issues um, and the issues affecting um, how those laws are, are played out for people. Um, so yes, I, I definitely think anyone can do legal advocacy. I don't think that there should be a bar if you don't have a law degree. Um, you know, I, I, as a lawyer, I often you know um, have to do a lot of educating myself before I can do advocacy on any issue. Um, so just because someone's a lawyer doesn't necessarily mean that they know the answers to every question. So um, I think that you know if you if you want to be an advocate, there's tons of information out there online on this issue, um, on all, and on other issues as well um, that you can access. Um, and obviously JDI has great resources as well um, that that can help inform how you how you you, you do that advocacy. Um, so no, I don't think you have to be a lawyer to be an advocate at all, and I don't think it conflicts, I actually think it is um, mm -hmm. consistent with your ethical duties as a counselor to be an advocate. Great. Thank you for that. And um, 
I hope everyone knows, and I want to uh, repeat it, that JDI can definitely help with any of your questions or with technical assistance. Um, we can try to help around a lot of these your legal questions. We can certainly provide you resources to other agencies who can who can help on that um, that level more specifically. Um, so, with that, if any, if uh, I don't know if anyone wants to add anything else, um, that was our last question. No, thank you. I was very honored to be on this webinar. I think it was something that was really needed and. Um, I'm sure that it's, the time is very short, but there's still much more information that we need to work together to get out to folks who are, you know, coming into the field, uh, you know, learning, uh, you know, trying to deal with this and, and talking about policies and also talking about survivors, you know, trans, specifically transgender survivors because that's a big deal. You know, a lot of people don't talk about transgender survivors. So Absolutely. thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. Thank, thank you. you for joining us. Thank you both so much, and thank you for everyone for um, for chiming in. I've been um, again, as as you just said, there's 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 still a lot of work to do, but but this is another area where the progress I've seen in a fairly short time is extremely exciting, and a lot of people have worked very hard. Um, but just the numbers of people who've been attending this series of webinars has been really heartening, and so thank you all who are listening for for joining us. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to you, Camila. Thank you. Um, one muted. All right. Thanks again, everyone. I just want to reiterate the thanks. Those are some great questions and really helpful answers. Um, I want to remind you all that much of what we discussed today is included in JDI publication, um, Hope Behind Bars, which you see here on the screen, an advocate's guide to helping survivors of sexual abuse behind bars. This guide is free and can be found on the Advocate Resources section of JDI's website. We certainly encourage you to download the guide for future reference and share it with your colleagues. Um, also, if you have any questions or need technical support, you can always contact us at advocate at justdetention.org and we'll get back to you within two business days. We also encourage you to visit the Advocate Resources page on our website for more archived webinars on a variety of topics for different fact sheets, tools like sample MOUs, and the forms um, that we've gone over in previous webinars. The link to that site is justdetention.org slash advocate dash resources. Um, JDI also has a resource guide for survivors of sexual abuse behind bars, which is a guide that lists legal and psychological counseling, counseling resources by state for survivors who are still incarcerated, for those who have been released, and for loved ones on the outside who are searching for ways to help. If your agency is interested in being listed as a resource in our resource guide, please fill out the form found on the link on your screen. Um, we'll also include the link in a follow-up email, which you'll receive later. Our next webinar will cover working with survivors in rural jails. That webinar will be on January 28th at 11 a.m. Pacific time. For more information, um, well, actually, we'll email more information on that in the coming weeks. Thank you so much for joining us. Please take a moment to complete the evaluation that we're going to send later and provide us your feedback. Um, thanks a lot.